one to to paying for single payer. Uh, we uh, are fortunate to have uh, Gerald Friedman with us tonight. Gary is our professor of economics at UMass, for those who don't know him. And he'll be giving, a, he's done a new ver report on how to pay for the current version of the uh, single payer bill in the state legislature. And we'll be talking about that uh, new version of the finances tonight. So welcome those for here from the Mass Care list and from the Western Mass Medicare for All list. I think that's uh, probably all the introduction we need. Jerry, you can take it away. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you all for coming and thank you, John and Sean and Stephanie for arranging this. Um, I could say this is paying for single payer, take five, take three. I don't know, I've, we've, some of you have come to these before. Uh, some of you have come to them several times before. Uh, so there'll be a lot of repetition because the basic issues haven't changed. The numbers keep going up with uh, time and inflation um, and the continued deterioration of the existing fee for sir, uh, the existing private health insurance, private uh, marketized healthcare system. Um, but that said, um, I'm always tweaking things, and I think every time, every go around, every iteration, the numbers get a little better. Um, and there's more to say because other things have gotten worse. Okay, so here's the getting worse. And this graph I haven't updated since um, the uh, COVID epidemic. Um, but this shows in the, you know, if you take away one thing, one measure of how bad our healthcare system is, both in delivering healthcare and in costing too much money, take this graph. Um, on the horizontal axis, you have spending, um, and each line is a country um, with spending in different years. So if you go back to 1970, all the way down here, we were spending a little bit more than everybody else. Since then, our spending has increased faster than any other countries. Now, if we were getting more and better healthcare, you could say, okay, we're spending money, we're getting better healthcare. You know, who's to criticize if we want to buy more healthcare or buy more life expectancy? But no. Our life expectancy has fallen behind every other country. These are all members of the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, so these are affluent countries like us. And our life expectancy has fallen behind them um, and fallen behind by ever more. You know, and we're not only talking about rich countries. We're not just talking about Switzerland or Norway or Sweden. No, we're talking about Chile, Greece, um, countries that you think we should be doing better than. You know, but as was pointed out in an article that I read a while ago, if you get to, um, if you're a black man in American inner cities, your life expectancy is worse than if you were in Lagos, Nigeria, or some other relatively poor African countries. Your life expectancy in the United States is not much better than in India, where, as I mentioned, my younger daughter has been hanging out. Um, on the other hand, you'll be spending a lot more. Now, why is 1970 a good year to start? Uh, that's because that's when we began to, in a serious way, privatize what uh, our healthcare system. Of course, it was privatized before we had private health insurance. But in the 60s, we established Medicare, Medicaid. And there were many people, including Richard Nixon, who were proposing major increases in health insurance to establish a national health insurance system. What Nixon proposed was a lot less than what Ted Kennedy wanted or what we wanted. But, but 1971 was when we first, when Congress first 
establish subsidies for HMOs, private health maintenance organizations. Um, this started as a reasonable idea because Kaiser Permanente back then was a very good healthcare system. Um, but obviously things got worse from there. At the same time, 1971 was also when Canada fully nationalized its Medicare system. I swear they call it Medicare just to make fun of us because their Medicare system is actually universal coverage. Um, well, our Medicare system, well, as you know, seem to have lost something there. Okay, um, moving on. Uh, now, we arguably have the best healthcare system of any state in the United States. Certainly we're in the top five. Hawaii maybe, Hawaii is better, almost certainly. Um, and, you know, a few other states, Minnesota, Oregon have very good healthcare systems. But we have as close to universal coverage as any large state. Um, but even in Massachusetts, there are parts of the Commonwealth where people do not go to the doctor because they can't afford it, and they die at higher rates than in other counties. Um, counties where the proportion of people report they cannot afford to see a doctor, uh, where that proportion is higher, have significantly higher mortality rates. And these are age-adjusted mortality rates. So it's not just that they're counties with old people. Um, you know, and these are counties where somewhat fewer people have health insurance, but the major factor is not whether people have health insurance, it's whether their health insurance actually allows them to go to the doctor, actually provides meaningful coverage. You know, if you have a $2,000 deductible as a standard for private health insurance these days, or a $3,000 deductible or a $4,000 deductible as not uncommon, then you really can't afford to go to the doctor, except if you know that you have a catastrophic condition. And of course, by the time you know it's a catastrophic condition, it may be too late. Um, Certainly, and this is the economist in me talking, certainly if you go to the doctor only when conditions have gotten really bad, it's going to cost a lot more to fix you, which contributes to this line stretching out towards the horizon. Okay, um, now, um, uh, a former co-teacher of mine, who you may have heard of, Ezekiel Emanuel. His brother was mayor of Chicago, and they made a TV show about his other brother uh, called Entourage. Uh, he was health advisor to uh, Richard Nick, uh, sorry, to um, Barack Obama. Very different. Um, Zeke's not a bad guy. Well, I don't know, but um, he's like, oh, you can't use life expectancy. You know, uh, those are numbers that are due to all sorts of things. You know, well, okay. You know, you take out homicides, take out gun deaths, uh, take out suicides, which may reflect poor health care. Take out opioid addictions. Um, and you take, and you're saying, okay, let's lower the US death rate by 200,000. And then compare our deaths with the number of deaths that you would expect in other countries, given their death rates. We still, currently, we're running before, sorry, not currently, before COVID, we were running at 400 to 500,000 excess deaths compared to the average for other countries standardizing on our age distribution. Take out the 200,000 or so deaths that I mentioned, and don't add back in, by the way, we are relatively safe drivers compared to other countries, one of the biggest causes of death. But okay, forget about that. You know, we're still 250, about 10% more deaths than we should have if we were like other countries. And that's apart from deaths by violence, deaths by suicide, deaths by overdoses. 
Then look what happened with COVID. And I actually wrote a paper on this. Um, well, with other people who paid us. Um, look what happened with COVID, 2020. We had 270,000 additional excess deaths because our healthcare system failed during COVID. And then the following year, 2021, 400,000 excess deaths, additional excess deaths because we had more deaths than other countries did with COVID. What accounts for these? Read our articles, lack of health insurance. Lack of health insurance explains most of the excess deaths that we had because of COVID. Now, this is not only people who didn't have health insurance, but places where people do not have health insurance, other people usually have worse health insurance. So you put those two together, and as much as 30% of, of our deaths from COVID have been because of, of the health insurance system. Um, okay, this, uh, this isn't my article, by the way. There's a link down here. Okay, so what can we do to fix it? <laughs> This is one of those things where, you know, even Zeke Emanuel, if you, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I'm not sure it's true, but many people who, many academics and health policy people, who if you ask them, what should we do about health care? And they'll go through, oh, value-based care, this, that, whatever. And then you say, well, what about single payer? And they'll say, well, if we could do it all from the beginning, Single pay would be the way to go, but it's too difficult to do now. Well, I think at least the first part of that is settled. If you go through the literature, there have been a whole lot of these studies, um, and everybody finds that if we had a single payer system on a state level or a national level, it would be cheaper than the current system even after you go to the expense of covering everybody and giving everybody access to health care uh, by give, providing not just insurance, but good insurance. Um, in our case, we're talking about good insurance without um, co-pays or deductibles. Um, yeah, the way I do it, which pretty much the way everybody does it, you start with the current system, you consider how much would it cost to cover everybody? How much would it cost to give everybody access? No copay, no deductible. And then if we're going to have a single system, how much would it cost to raise Medicaid prices to the prices that we're paying everybody else? Um, you know, that might seem like, oh, just a bonus to the doctors, which it is, of course. Um, but it's also provides access. You can have Medicaid. In Massachusetts, Mass Health is pretty good at this, but still, you can have Medicaid, but it doesn't mean you're going to be able to take it to a doctor who will actually treat you because the rates are a lot lower than, um, than they get from Medicare or other places. Okay, so that gives you the expense. Then you think about the savings from the administration of the health insurance system instead of all the advertising and all the um, utilization review and all the negotiations that the insurance companies do, just give and, and the high pay to their CEOs, get rid of that, um, just run administration on something like the Medicare system level, um, save money on provider administration, you know, go into a doctor's office, you look around the corner and you find all the people who, what is their job? Their job is to process paper for the insurance system. Um, and then, you know, let's get serious about negotiating drug prices and device prices. Um, and, oh boy, this is a tough one. Let's negotiate prices with Mass General Hospital and the other elite monopoly hospitals. It's not that they're elite. That's fine. I'm happy with that. I love Dana Farber. But let's negotiate prices with monopoly hospitals that overcharge because they can get away with it. Um, and 
you know, some providers. And then this is an a magic asterisk number, fraud. We know there's fraud in the system. It's very hard for private health insurers to eliminate fraud. Um, a state system with subpoena powers, with police powers, could reduce it. Um, estimates run between 8 and 15% fraudulent billing. I'm assuming we'll get rid of two percentage points of total cost because by reducing fraudulent billing. That's nobody really knows. Um, fortunately, the whole system doesn't depend at all on that. Okay, source of revenue, we have current revenues that are what we're already spending, the Medicaid system, Medicare, and you know, as John signaled, we can talk about that, um, and uh, the Veterans Administration, which we're not going to be touching, so that just flows in one way out the other. Um, and we're left with a certain amount of money, new taxes. Um, we can call them something else. We can call them premiums. We can call them something more innocuous sounding. But at some point, we're going to have to collect more money. Okay, um, here's what we start with. And I'm looking at 2025. I did this by blowing up what we were spending in 2019, adjusting for population changes, um, projected rate of growth in spending, using estimates from the Commonwealth, um, the, uh, not the Group Insurance Commission, the Committee uh, Commission on Health Insurance Costs, um, which are lower numbers of inflation than the feds have been predicting. Um, uh, and that gets you personal health care, that's spending on, on providers, what you spend to go to the doctor, not counting insurance administration. Um, $110 billion in 2025. Then improved access. That's when we eliminate co-pays and deductibles. Um, and when we provide coverage for everybody. Um, $4.8 billion. Honestly, that may be a little low. It may be high. I assume very little hospital usage increase because if you're going to the hospital, you're going to be going to the hospital. Um, more increase in dental and vision. Um, otherwise, um, I used estimates of the impact of improving health insurance quality uh, from the uh, CMS, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Raising Medicaid prices gets us up to five, well, another 4.9 billion. So that's total personal health care. Add to that insurance administration at the rate of current health insurance administration. Uh, the current um, actuarial value of health insurance plans, uh, so, sorry, sorry, the Medicare loss ratio of health insurance plans, which is the proportion of premiums that get spent on health care, is a little less than 88%. So over 12% of your health insurance dollars and this includes Medicaid, it includes Medicare, and it includes the group health ins the group insurance commission for the Commonwealth. Um, over twelve percent is spent on administration by the health insurance companies. Private health insurers spend about twenty percent on in, in administration. You know, average CEO salaries are ten million dollars plus. Okay, that gives you the total system. Exist the existing system, if we were covering everybody, would cost under $35 billion. Savings, um, hospital price adjustments um, would be $11 billion. Um, you know, negotiating prices with hospitals, lowering them all to the Medicare rate. Now, mind you, Mass General gets a higher Medicare rate. I'm picking on Mass General, but that's they're the worst for this. Uh, they get a higher Medicare rate than any other hospital in the Commonwealth because they are an urban hospital, so they get a bump up, and they are a research and teaching hospital, so they get a bump up. Um, and we would lower everybody to 10% above what they're getting now. Oh, sorry, 10% above what they're getting now from Medicare. 
Mass General actually has very low Medicare billing because they can make more money on private health insurance people. They steer Medicare billing to some of their satellite facilities like Cooley Dickinson. Um, other hospitals get more Medicaid people and get more, um, like I said, more Medicare people and more free care. Um, so those hospitals will do very well under the system. The big losers on that $11 billion, and we'll talk about it some more later, um, are the elite urban teaching hospitals. Okay, physician price adjustment, lowering physician prices by about $2 billion. Those are elite physicians. You know, um, you get an explanation of benefits from your insurer. Um, I mostly open them, uh, you know, and stick them in a drawer. Uh, but occasionally you look at them and it's like, wow, they charged that? <laughs> you know, uh, drug and device pricing, $10 billion. Most of that is lower prices for prescription drugs. Prescription drugs in the United States have been going crazy. Prescri prescription drug prices. Um, when I first started doing this stuff about 20 years ago, the estimate was that U.S. prescription drugs were about 37% more expensive than prescription drugs in other countries. That was from McKinsey. Now, according to RAND, they're over 200% as expensive as in other countries. Um, so uh, we would lower those to world levels, or not to world levels, to half of what they are now, which is what the Veterans Administration pays. Now, the Veterans Administration is a good comparison here because it's about the same size as Massachusetts. Uh, drug pr uh, device pricing, uh, my wife hurt her knee, so she got a brace um, recently. Uh, we got a bill from the brace company for $75. And I, yeah, I looked at that, I passed it to her, I said, hey, you know, uh, that seems a little high. I mean, our deductible, da, da, da. Okay, so she called and she found out, yeah, they had already gotten the insurance uh, money. The company was charging $700 for this piece of plastic with Velcro. $75 seemed like a perfectly reasonable price for this brace. $700? Okay, provide administration. Um, this is the people in the offices. This does not include all the time wasted for doctors. About 20, 25% of doctor time is, is spent on billing and insurance related issues. Uh, insurance administration, that's getting rid of most of the insurance, getting rid of all their advertising, getting rid of all that stuff and running a state system as efficiently as the Medicare system in Washington, getting rid of fraud. Total savings, $48 billion. Um, some, someone's going to lose money. There'll be winners, there'll be losers. Hospital networks will be big losers. They're going to have to lean up or lean down, become more lean. Some highly paid specialists will lose. Um, big pharma will be the big lose. It's there. Poorly paid staff will be losing jobs. Um, so... Our bill provides for retraining and insur and unemployment insurance adjustments. You know, I might point out that the average, as of a couple of years ago, and I think it's probably worse now, the average person has an eight month turnover in these jobs. They don't like the jobs very much. We're not hurting them very much by helping them get something better. Doctors and hospitals will win big on Medicaid price adjustment. Um, and insurance administration, they'll be lose. Cheetahs will lose on fraud, like the senator, the senior senator from Florida, whose company had a five hundred bill, five hundred million dollar Medicare fraud uh, fine. Rick Scott. Okay, here are the existing revenues. Again, I took twenty nineteen, I massaged it a little, and blew it up to twenty twenty five. Medicare. There, to get that money, we're going to have to get the feds to agree to us establishing a Medicare Part C type program and then offer that to everybody. 
Now, everybody who joins that program, we will be paying their premium, their Medicare Part B premium. We'll be paying any Medicare Part D premiums. They will get a better insurance plan than any private company is offering. No co-pays, no deductibles, full range of services. Um, so I think that virtually everybody will sign up, especially since facing competition like that, private insurers are going to exit the state, the Commonwealth. Um, but we will need cooperation. Um, the feds will have to agree to this. Now, the rules of Medicare are very clear. You can offer a Medicare Part C program so long as your coverage is as good as existing Medicare. So they would have no business turning us down. Um, okay, Medicare, Medicaid, that's a state program. We can do whatever we want, so long as we're not reducing coverage. Um, and even there, the feds have been letting states reduce coverage. The VA, we're not touching. There are other revenue from state, from school, public health programs, et cetera. Um, we'll be picking all that up, um, you know, which will be great if we actually provide nurses in every school in the Commonwealth, um, which is, an ex to be sure, that's an expense I'm not counting. There'll still be some out-of-pocket because existing um, uh, federal uh, data includes spending on bandages at CVS, uh, aspirin, et cetera. We're not going to pay for that stuff. People have to still have to do that themselves. Um, there'll be more ACA subsidies because there are, a, there are more people. Some of the people who are not covered, who do not have health insurance, actually could get an ACA subsidy if they signed up. And then Medicaid. Because we'll be paying higher prices, we'll get half of that money back from the feds. And there are people who are not covered by Medicare who are eligible. Um, okay, with all that, we're still going to need, um, we're still going to need, uh, how much did I say? Oh, we're still going to need like $20 billion more. We'll get the current plan has 31, $30.6 billion in revenue coming from payroll tax. There are exemptions for small employee employers, um, a tax on non-wage income. We get $30 billion. Um, that gives us a $7.5 billion surplus. That's enough to cover, you know, my mistakes. Um, now, to be sure, there is other money um, because, well, we'll get to this in a minute, but there are, this is not counting the money that public employers are paying for health insurance for their workers over and above the 10% uh, tax rate. Um, okay, we'll come to that in a minute. Okay, middle class gets a big tax cut. You know, I am less, you know, this is a progressive tax program because of the tax on non-wage income, which is mostly earned or mostly collected by the rich and super rich. Um, but that said, even a program that was less progressive would still be progressive in impact because the current system, we pay for health insurance with a lump sum tax, a private tax in effect, um, because in Massachusetts, you're required to have health insurance. So this is a Commonwealth mandated private tax collected by a private insurance company as a lump sum, everybody pays the same amount. The 25,000 or so that um, the cost of my health insurance is the same as the 25,000 that is the cost of the department secretary's health insurance who earns half what I get. And that's the same 25,000 that is the cost of the janitor's health insurance who earns a third or a quarter of what I get. It's just that 25,000, while it's really unpleasant for me, is burdensome for the secretary and crushing for the janitor. Yeah. Um, you know, so getting rid of that and putting in something, a, a premium 
that's related to income is going to be really good for low-wage people, good for middle-income people. And, well, as you can see, millionaires are going to be shouldering the load, which is fine with me. They can afford it. Um, okay, the public will save money, and this is where we get, you know, another area if we want to tap into it. Um, in 2021, I estimate, and this is using Department of Revenue data, um, there are some issues with these data. For some towns and cities, numbers look a little, little weird. Uh, but I think the basic number hold, you know, results hold. Um, towns and cities are spending a lot on health insurance, and so is the Commonwealth. Um, the reasons for this are a teeny bit complicated. A little bit that Commonwealth Health Insurance, um, the Group Insurance Commission, and you know what's offered by cities and towns tends to be somewhat better health insurance than is offered by private employers. Um, uh, unions have negotiated, wherever they're involved, unions always negotiate for health insurance at the expense of wages. I, I may be wrong, but every union negotiation I've ever been involved with, that's been the case. Um, uh, one of my teachers in grad school, Richard Free Freeman, actually has a paper about this. Um, that said, uh, the larger factor is a hidden one. Um, public employers offer family coverage at a much better rate than private employers. Family coverage has almost disappeared from the private sector. Um, if you have children and you work for a private employer, you're largely out of luck. Um, so in many cases, who's covering these people? Who's covering the children? Around Amherst, you see, if you see, at least around Amherst, you have the answer, which is the spouse, one of the spouses, one of the parents works for the, for the Commonwealth, often at a low wage job. Um, but because they're there, they get family coverage. And then the whole family is shifted onto the public purse public health insurance. So the public sector is providing a health insurance subsidy to private sector employers by covering the family members of private sector employers. Um, you know, we had guys fixing our roof a few years ago. Both of them were married to teachers and they went into business together. They don't have health insurance in their construction job and they're walking around on the roof, not, not safe. Um, but the teacher wives have health insurance, and that's what's paying for uh, their, their kids and themselves to have health insurance. That's a common phenomenon looking at the numbers. Um, okay, so cities and towns will save 1.8 billion dollars maybe amherst could fix the goddamn potholes in the roads um i would like that uh the commonwealth will save almost a billion dollars itself um by moving from the current system to the more efficient system and a system that would spread the burden of health care across the commonwealth to all employers um, we should have faster economic growth coming from this by ending job lock. This is something that um, the Penn Wharton Center people who did the numbers for Elizabeth Warren's um, proposed health care plan in 2020. Um, I was only very peripherally involved, so I'm not taking any responsibility or credit. Um, it wasn't bad, it wasn't a bad plan, but the Penn Wharton people estimated that eliminating job lock would uh, raise productivity growth by about 0.3% a year, which is quite good. Um, what's interesting is that I, um, oh, and also healthier people are more productive. They didn't factor that in. But what I did was I looked at 
uh, productivity growth rate across the OECD as a function of various factors, including the quality of the health insurance measured by preventable years of lives lost. And the US is pretty bad on that. We have the worst numbers on preventable years of lives lost. If we move to the middle of the range, which is where I would expect us to go, at least the middle with this health insurance program, then Massachusetts would experience faster per capita growth, um, income growth. Healthier people don't get sick as much, show up to work more often, feel better, are able to be more productive. Um, and people can move to the job that fits them best rather than being stuck at a particular job because God damn it, they've got, I've got health insurance. And my kids can go to the doctor that they, they used to. Um, okay, so, uh, okay. Um, there are some big losers. The biggest losers are the prescription drugs and the nursing and the durable medical products, um, like my wife's um, race company. Hospitals are losing. They're saving some money. They're getting more from Medicaid um, and they're saving money on no longer paying for free care. That said, um, they're still gonna be losing. And those losses will be concentrated in the urban elite hospitals. Mass General now owns over 20 hospitals throughout the Commonwealth. Um, they own a lot of prescription pra uh, practices. They use all these to funnel the most, the highest paid patients to Boston while dispersing the Medicare and Medicaid cases in the periphery. Um, you know, this is all financial manipulation and they use it to maintain high billing rates. Um, they're not gonna be able to do that. Um, physician, clinical, they lose a little bit of money, but that's a wash really. They gain on Medicaid. They lose on rates for a little bit. I mean, a few high, most highly paid, um, you know, people may be losing a little bit of money, but they're going to have a much better lifestyle because they're not going to have to talk to some snot-nosed person in some insurance company in Omaha, Nebraska, and beg for um, approval for, you know, to do what they know needs to be done. Um, so they're fine. Other professionals, and these include, you know, uh, vision and psych uh, and psychological counselors. They'll gain uh, higher Medicare rates, uh, Medicaid rates, and also because they'll be able to uh, treat more people, um, especially vision. Uh, majority of people don't have vision coverage. Dental services, they'll gain a lot because they'll really gain on the dental coverage. Uh, more people will be covered. More people will be getting dental care, which is a good thing. Um, and um, they'll have uh, higher rates on Medicaid. A home health care will gain. That's a very heavily Medicaid dependent field. Nursing home will gain another Medicaid dependent field. Um, and then other health is just, you know, random various stuff, very small numbers of people anyway. Okay, the hospitals to zero in on them because they are the major, uh, a major political problem. Everybody knows the health insurance company will hate this. Everybody knows the drug companies will hate this. And those are two big, powerful lobbies in Massachusetts. But the other one is the hospitals. And to quote Elizabeth Rosenthal in the New York Times last year, year before, Everybody loves the hospitals. People donate money to the hospitals. Mass General is always sending me requests for money. It's like, you gotta be kidding. The only thing worse is I get requests from Harvard for money. You gotta be kidding me. I'm not gonna give money to you know, these institutions with, they've got plenty of money, but okay. Mass uh, hospitals now $40 billion. They'll gain coverage expansion. That's nice. Uh, they gain from Medicaid rates, um, and they gain from reduced charity and free care. Um, you know, they're giving, you know, they're not, I'm projecting 2025, there'll be about $1.2 billion in free care, um, a bit more than they do now. Uh, but 
lowering prices is going to hit them. And again, it's going to be the elite hospitals with the biggest political clout. Um, hospitals in, you know, Berkshire Medical, if they're still around, Cooley Dickinson, you know, hospitals outside the elite circle will will gain. Um, but the elite hospitals, the must-have hospitals that are able to dictate prices to the insurance companies, uh, they will be losing. They can't dictate prices to Medicare. Medicare is too big and too powerful. Um, okay, so issues to think about going forward. I've been playing around with numbers on these things, and I'll get back to it at some point. Uh, transition to lean of financing. That really depends on what on earth are they spending their money on? You know, $4 million for the CEO at Mass General, you know, um, and on down to others. That's a lot of money for individuals, but it doesn't really add up to all that much in Mass General. Um, I know they've been buying a lot of real estate. They've been building a lot of buildings. We were in Dana-Farber recently. I have real mixed feelings. It's a beautiful building. You know, nice atrium, beautiful, original art. You really feel good being there. But is this where we want to be spending our money? I don't know. I had a little dialogue with some friends about this. And, you know, um, but they definitely are spending a lot of money on amenities. Um, uh, can Massachusetts stand up against drug and device companies? I think we can. Um, I think we can because um, we're big enough, although, you know, I mean, the VA does, and the VA is no bigger than us. We will have to establish a formulary and be prepared to walk away and say, well, we're not going to fund this drug. We're not going to pay for this drug. Also, California has been leading the way in starting to manufacture some drugs on its own. California is investing in producing insulin. Um, yeah, they're not going to make it themselves, but they're contracting with another company. They're establishing um, the uh, infrastructure. Um, many of the other highly expensive drugs have a generic counterpart like insulin, which by the way, you probably know this, the chemist, the Canadian chemist who established artificial insulin um, donated it to the world for $1, um, just like Jonas Salk. Uh, I believe yesterday or today was the anniversary of the first trials of the polio vaccine. Um, Jonas Salk donated it to the world, made some beautiful statement about how nobody should profit from saving people's lives. Um, boy, they should put his words on you know, a billboard opposite. Biogen and some of these other drug companies. Okay, federal Medicare funding. As I said, I I would, you know, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, I have brothers who are lawyers, and I would be willing to fight on that hill. Okay, what the hell? Read my book, um, and this is. Um, I am open to questions. Thank you all for your attention. Yeah, thanks for people who have been putting questions into the chat. Uh, John's been compiling those, and we can take some of those. And see, there's also a hand up. John, do you want to do? I want to go with some of the chat ones. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Jerry. Um, what? Um, some of them, of course, gravitated to the uh, the hospital area. We we should focus there a little bit. But um, one of the early things, Jerry, that you uh, dwelled on was the loss of life due to the failure to have a single payer system. Or uh, So there is a question and we have Senator Jamie Eldridge, uh, one of the bill lead sponsors here tonight. He asks, in terms of excess COVID deaths, does your report highlight how our poor public health infrastructure contributed to those deaths from the pandemic? Um, now that you mention it, we we did 
a lot, we were focused on the effect of health insurance coverage. Um, and along the way, we factored out public health activities. Uh, so we could go back. It would be, that's a very good question. We should, we could go back and should go back um, and look at the effects of these public health activities as a separate uh, independent factor. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point. And it's kind of, you know, you focus on certain things and you lose track of other things. Yeah, I mean, we have those numbers. We just never looked at them. Um, you know, we have um, a whole vector, uh, Travis Campbell, graduate student here, uh, who did the actual econometric work, and that was in Oregon. Um, he constructed a whole vector of public health activities, lockdowns, mask mandates, et cetera, um, as well as spending on public health in the county. Um, this is a county level analysis. Um, and, uh, um, you know, so he has the numbers. I, I am going to make a note and get back to Travis about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. So um, a few questions regarding the hospitals, but before we get to some more general ones, can you do a basic explanation of global budgeting? Frank Farkas says, how does so-called global budgeting for hospitals work? And how does it compare to how hospitals are paid today? Okay, um, global budgeting is um, something that, uh, the idea of global budgeting is we're going to treat the, um, uh, I've kind of, somehow I've lost vi video. Do you people still, everyone still sees me? Yes. Um, okay, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, a global budgeting treats hospitals like the same way we treat the um, Amherst Fire Department. Um, we give the fire department a budget and we tell them you fight all fires in this town. We can estimate, you know, we, we demarcate, you fight all the fires within this area. Um, and we can estimate if it's a large enough area, you know, how many fires there are gonna be. So we can kind of work out the budget and the fire department hires the appropriate number of people. Occasionally, they'll have to come back for more money. Um, occasionally, they'll refund some money to the town. The same for the uh, police department. The same for many public services. Um, so the idea, and this way, there's no bookkeeping about activities. I mean, of course, you do keep track of how many fires because that's useful information. Um, but you're not billing individuals. You're not doing any of that. Um, the idea of global budgeting is we would do hospitals in the same way. Hospitals would have a certain area that they're supposed to cover, um, and they treat everybody within that area. It would give the hospitals an incentive to treat people in the most efficient way. Um, so if you have people who are developing, you know, well, people who have... Um, diabetes, for example, or maybe people who are pre-diabetic, you identify those people before they have a problem and you help them with diet, you help them with um, monitoring their uh, sugar levels, et cetera, uh, because that's cheaper for the hospital than um, having them come down with some worse condition, losing their eyes or whatever. Um, you know, hypertension. There are other it, there are other areas where if we do more preventive care, um, people will be better off and we'll save money. Um, that's the idea of global budgeting. Uh, it's done something like that is done in some places. Uh, the state of Maryland has been experimenting with this. They are the last state to keep hospital price controls, which was abandoned in Massachusetts, I believe under uh, Bill Weld. Um, uh, Maryland kept that system. They moved to, it didn't seem to help much, but about 
10 years ago, they moved away from it and they adopted a variant of global budgeting. Um, and there is evidence they definitely have slowed, dramatically slowed healthcare hospital cost increases in Maryland. And there's evidence that they've been doing at least some of that controlling increases through expanded preventive care. Um, and Maryland, I mean, Maryland, it's not like Maryland has second rate hospitals, whatever. I mean, what they have Johns Hopkins. You know, one of the world's top hospitals, comparable to Mass General. Um, you know, so, you know, we're talking about a serious place with the diversity of areas and uh, comparable in size to Massachusetts. Um, I've been a little hesitant myself. I, I know I got into big fights with some people about this. Um, I've been hesitant about global budgeting um, because. Um, scoping out the areas um, strikes me as difficult in a small, compact area like Boston, where people, and in Massachusetts, people often go to hospitals across the area. If Dana-Farber has a global budget, would they treat me? <laughs> you know, or would they say, oh, no, you have to go to your local hospital? Um I don't know enough about Maryland to know how they handle that problem uh, because Johns Hopkins also is a major export industry. They treat people from all over the world, as does Mass General um, and all, all over the state. So, um, you know, I'm not sure about the details, but I certainly think it's something we need to look into. Um, and it has worked in Maryland. I mean, the the literature I've seen is universal that this is on a uh, cost effective and improving health. But it's a great question. Definitely something need to look into more. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Jerry. And staying with the hospital question, just a moment or two more. Could you comment on critical access hospitals? Will they continue to get higher reimbursement? This is from Henry Rose. Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, they would get um critical access hospitals uh would benefit more from the medicaid adjustment um they also would uh benefit from i don't know this for a fact but i suspect that they do a lot more free care and they would benefit from getting coverage there um uh so they would benefit on those uh they would get their current medicare rate plus 10% um, so, you know, they'd be, there may be some lost revenue from the uh, disproportionate hospital coverage, whatever the, the exact title is these days, uh, but I th it would be more than made up for. They would be winners. You know, as I said, the losses in the hospital sector would be concentrated in those with market power. The critical access hospitals do not have market power. Unfortunately, they should. <laughs> you know, they're doing God's work, but I'm afraid they don't. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. we would we would add at Mass Care that the uh, critical hospitals, that the hospital, the distribution of hospital beds is going to be, uh, the power to distribute them uh, equitably is going to be one of the functions of the new Massachusetts Healthcare Trust, and. Um, there will be a lot of power in that trust to make sure that the uh, hospitals continue to exist uh, where, uh, they're, where they're under threat. That very important because as we know, as these hospitals throughout the Commonwealth are being bought up by Mass General, Mass General is funneling patients, the high paid patients to Boston um, and then turning around saying, oh, this hospital is losing money. You know, so, you know, we should be cutting back. And the more you cut back on the on the regional hospitals, um, the more patients are funneled to Boston and, until you get to the point where Mass General can say, we don't need this hospital, it should be closed. It's a money loser. Um, you know, putting the idea of which hospitals we're going to have, putting that on some marketplace thing that, you know, we'll make this decision on the basis of who's making money rather than who's providing health care is, well, it will be great to change that. Thank you. 
and uh, uh, Sandy Eaton, who's uh, probably officially, I was going to say unofficially, the historian of the single payer movement in Massachusetts has put a historical comment in the chat about hospital uh, regulation or deregulation. And I think what we're saying here is that we agree with uh, um, a point that Barbara Pearson made in the chat that the single payer would give a level of rationality in resource allocation across the state. Um, so back to an earlier question, uh, Henry Rose also asked, what would you have us tell administrators at his two local hospitals, uh, Pittsfield and Great Barrington? Um, I guess, uh, what would you have us have us tell them about their future under a single pair is what he's getting at. Uh, Pittsfield and Great Barrington, I would think that they would, you know, I haven't looked at the numbers there in particular, but I would think that they would do very well. Um, they would benefit from the Medicaid price adjustment. They would benefit from eliminating free care because everybody will be covered. They will get a little boost in revenues because, although it's not a big factor in hospitals, but you know, people without good health insurance now will be more inclined to get care. That's a small factor. When it comes to hospitals, I think the end you end up going to the hospital. Um, and then they're not going to have to be negotiating with the with all these different um, uh, insurance companies. Um, their lives will be a lot simpler. They'll know how much money they're getting, whether we do a global budgeting or whether we do a fee for service, they'll be able to budget more easily and more rationally. Um, and they're not going to have to be fighting with eight different health insurers plus the GIC, plus um, the different uh, town plans, plus mass care. They're not going to... Uh, sorry, mass health. They're not going to have to be fighting with them all. They'll be able to just do their business of providing health care. Uh, they'll be saving a lot of money on staff <clears throat> because they're not going to have to have, you know, that office filled with bill keepers. Um, and they're not going to have to be doing, you know, what do they call it? Uh, code upcoding. <laughs> they're not going to, I've, I was, talked to a nurse a few years back at um, a hospital in Worcester who told me, oh, we, yeah, they sent all of the, all of us out for a long weekend retreat to learn to upcode, you know, raising the designation for people, for patients, so that you can get more money from the insurance company. Terrible for understanding our healthcare situation. Um, and of course, a complete waste. And then, of course, the insurance companies fight up coding. So everybody just spends more time um, with lawyers. Uh, so they'll, their lives will be a lot easier and they'll be because they'll be able to focus on health care. Um, and financially, they'll be fine. Plus, they're not going to have to worry about Mass General swooping in and buying them up. Um, or Mass General getting their patients diverted to Boston because Mass General owns the primary care physicians in the area. Mass General claims, well, partners a few years ago claimed that they lost $72,000 on every physician that they bought, physician practice that they bought, to which you'd say, well, why do they buy them? Well, the reason is because what they lose at the physician level, they gain by steering patients to the more expensive um, care facilities. Um, I say this as a Harvard alum. I love Mass General. It's just as a financial institution, right. it's it's an atrocity. Right. Well, you have to have, to have something. Uh, okay, so moving right along. The uh, by the way, there's a few uh, uh, historical questions or factual questions in the chat that other people in the group might want to answer in the chat. Uh, such as uh, the law, has anyone, have other hospitals been lost in Western Mass since 2014? But sticking to the economic analysis, mm -hmm. um, we have um, a question regarding the uh, premiums, um, the, uh, not the premiums, but um, 
we're calling it a tax for now, and the premiums we've called a private tax. How, do the, how does the current split between employer and employee compare to the proposed split under our bill, you know, the two and a half and the seven and a half or eight? Mm -hmm. That's um, about... Well, yeah, go ahead. That's about the same as the current split. Of course, there are employers that are different, uh, but the average for private employers in the state um, and the average for public employers uh, of the Commonwealth is about 75-25. So we're preserving that. You know, there, there are still a handful of employers who pay 100%, um, and there are some who go down as low as 50%. Um, there are some who will offer family coverage, but the employee has to pick up all the cost above what they were, what the employer was paying for the uh, seventy-five percent of the individual coverage, so that yeah. gets to a much lower number. But we're in the ballpark of what's currently being done. And uh, <clears throat> that was from Philip Katz, by the way. He also said uh, that uh, Jerry talked about having individuals pay ten percent. So let's clear that up. What? What we're proposing in the bill is a two and a half percent individual payroll tax, and the employer paying seven and a half, depending on size, a hundred or more will pay eight percent, and that's the split we were just talking to that relative split. However, the bill allows for the employer and especially uh, unionized employers will this will be a, on the bargaining table to pay a hundred percent of this 10% total tax or 10.5 total tax. So employees may pay uh, from zero to two and a half percent through an agreement that will be protected by the state law and will also not be income, not be considered income to the employees. So I hope that answers Phil's question. Yeah, it does, thanks a lot. Great. So then we have, um, Sticking with the uh, payroll tax uh, questions, Joan at the Odyssey Bookshop says an additional 10% payroll tax on small business is difficult on our bottom line. It could wipe out our bottom line. It would be wonderful to have all employees to be covered by good insurance. Making the numbers work will be a real challenge. So what would you say to, to uh, us? Uh, that, is, that is absolutely uh, an issue because many... Uh, for those small employers who do provide health insurance, um, they will really benefit because a small employer who's providing health insurance is paying at a much higher premium to the private health insurance company than a large employer. Rates go down with size. Um, economies to scale and bill processing and administration and also um, reduced risk when you have a larger uh, pool. So the small employers are in the worst position now, of uh, the small employers who are paying for health insurance now. The problem comes up that many small employers do not provide health insurance. Now, part of me feels just angry and mean. You're a small employer, somebody is covering your people, either a public employer who's covering them through a private plan, uh, uh, who's covering it through a family plan or mass health, maybe, um, or maybe they just show up when sick and depend on free care, you know, whatever it is, somebody's paying, you know, and as an employer, you should be paying, uh, you know, just like everybody else pays. We should all be chipping in. You sh we shouldn't be subsidizing you. Probably it, there's reason why I have never run for elective office because I would come out saying things like that. Um, and to be fair, you know, knowing small employers who cover people like Nick Seaman at the Black Sheep in Amherst, where I recommend you get sandwiches, um, or others, um, you know, it's not easy. Um, and sometimes, especially when you're starting out, um, or if you're in a business that's an area where you're facing Amazon, et cetera, you know, um, you know, small, the small employers could be providing a major public service. Um, we probably should, just like I've been 
thinking about transition plans for the hospitals. Um, we should be thinking about transition plans for in, um, for small for uh, employers, those who have not been providing health insurance. We should, you know, we shouldn't have that mean attitude that I just expressed and say, well, okay, but we should give them time to adjust. I don't want to say we want to subsidize them because why should we be subsidizing employers by size class? You know, I definitely think we should subsidize bookstores if that helps, but that's <laughs> that's not something we can really do. Um, you know, uh, I try, I buy books, but uh, mm. I've, I estimated uh, two years ago that I've added four linear feet of books every year since college. Um, I, I had to measure for bookcases. Um, uh, and I don't think I've slowed down much. So, you know, well, um, it's, yeah, but it's it, a real, it's a real issue because it, if it, we're going it, to succeed politically, we need to address the legitimate concerns of small businesses. Well, we're, we're, uh, at Mass Care, we are launching a, um, a business uh, committee for single payer and there will be the ability of business people to weigh in on, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, as folks, most folks know, we reevaluate the tax structure and the budget of this trust fund every two years. Um, one thing to clear up though, uh, is that when we were talking before about the split between employer and employees uh, of the premium, it's the ratio that we were talking about, not the amount. Employer and employees will both pay about half what they're paying now under the current system. Is that about right? Yeah, that's about right. Um, as And for small businesses that are providing health insurance, it will be an even bigger saving. Uh, the problem comes in for the small employers who are not providing health insurance, because virtually every large employer already does. Um, and many small employers do. But small a small employer who is not providing health insurance now, they're going to suddenly be hit with a bill. Um, I think it's fair that they should, as I said, I think it's fair that they should be paying, but we need to ease, at least we need to ease, we probably need to ease the transition if for no other reason than politically. Yeah, um, and of course, there'll be a lot of discussion of that uh, in our uh, committees at Mass Care. Um, so another question uh, regarding uh, the coverage uh, and the reimbursement. Uh, Jean Anestas says, uh, what about mental health, behavioral health care? Current providers are worried about lower reimbursements. Not all take Medicare patients because reimbursements are lower than from private insurance. Uh, yeah, if you have private insurance. Um, I, uh, living in Amherst, we know uh, uh, several practitioners um, and none of them take private insurance. Um, I guess in other places they do. Um, most And most people do not have insurance coverage at all. Uh, so for, that would cover mental health. So even if you have a, um, even if you are taking private insurance, um, your, uh, your clients aren't going to be covered. So this will, generally speaking, be a gain for um, behavioral health people, because everybody will be covered for behavioral health. Yeah, the reimbursements are not going to be as high as private health insurance, but private health insurance rates are usually pretty low. I know that there was a big stink a few years ago, and there was actually a successful lawsuit in New York State because the private health insurance rates were, what they said were community rates were ridiculously low. Um, and they, uh, it may have been the public employee plan um, I talked to some people about this 10 years ago. So um, anyway, I looked and saw what the rates were, and they were higher than um, uh, Beacon was offering for people in the, uh, the, the UMass Group Insurance Commission. So 
I don't think that many people will be losing by not getting private health insurance <laughs> rates. Um, and they will be gaining substantially because people are able to afford coverage since they will be you know, covered for behavioral health, which will be a gain for everybody. Thanks, Jerry. We're gonna, we still have some questions in the queue and I, I'd like to get to all, all of them. Um, there's uh, a question from Adam Cook. Are there overlaps between administrators at health insurance companies and other types of insurance companies in other words, would those who lose jobs in the move from private to single payer find transferable knowledge and skills? I'm sure some. And there are people who, agents who sell health insurance, who also sell um, uh, you know, automobile insurance, whatever. But I think generally they're not transferable skills. It would be... And even if they were, presumably these other uh, divisions of the health insurer are um, already fully staffed. I mean, in a serious way, although it's kind of gross, I suggested um, in my book that we might consider just buying the health insurance companies. Um, it's kind of gross to think about, oh, you guys are doing such bad things. I've also suggested in another context that we buy the goddamn fossil fuel companies just so we can close them down before we roast the planet. Um, but uh, you know, this is comparable to compensation for slavery, um, buying, you know, which Lincoln proposed as late as 1864. Um, we'll just buy all the slaves. It'll be cheaper than fighting the war. Um, uh, well, let's, that's... Not, let's not digress too much. <laughs> right. They, sorry. They, sorry. I'm, I'm wandering. We should, yeah. we should tell the audience that the yeah. <laughs> there's more to study regarding the impact yeah. on the workforce. Mm -hmm. And yeah. many of the transferable skills do belong to those in the insurance business who are nurses and doctors. Oh, there's no question. Those people will be fully employed. There's no problem there. Doctors and nurses who are currently wasting their time and wasting their training. Um, doing utilization review and other activities for the insurance industry will find plenty of opportunities to work in a constructive way, treating the currently uninsured and underinsured. Um, and doctors who are now spending hours every day processing information for the health insurance industry will be able to apply those hours to uh, treating their patients. Um, instead of these 12 minute or maybe 15 minute intervals, they'll be able to maybe spend 20 minutes. Wouldn't that be nice for everybody? And sticking with the workforce questions, uh, Henry Rose asks, many of us docs trained at elite urban institutions. If these institutions do less well, won't that hurt the supply of well-trained docs? Already a problem in the Berkshires. Uh, if the if the elite institutions like Mass General do less well, will they no longer take residents? Yeah, you know, I don't know. Um, I think that it's reasonable to ask why would would they really do let that much less well? Medicare rates are adequate. We're adding ten percent. The American Hospital Association claimed Medicare rates are currently 9% below cost. I don't buy the number, but let's accept it. And we're raising their rates by 10%. We're adding Medicaid, improved Medicaid reimbursement. That helps them. We're taking some of the burden of administrative costs off them. Um, if Medicare was such a bad deal, why does virtually every hospital in the country take Medicare? They may not love it, but they'll be, they'll be able to treat patients and train residents uh, perfectly well. Um, and think about how much better your life will be as a doctor if you don't have to deal with the health insurance system. Um, and how many doctors have left the profession because of burnout associated with having to process paper for the insurance industry. Having to get, to quote my friend, 
some snot nose in Omaha who knows nothing about my patients having to get that person to approve uh, needed treatment. A treatment that you, after a decade of training, are qualified to prescribe. Um, so all things considered, um, you know, I don't think that we need to worry, but if we are worried, there's a simple solution. Mass care should pick up, and I know it's not in the bill, but it's something for us to think about going forward. Mass care should pick up the cost of, of medical training on condition that you stay in the Commonwealth for four years or something. You know, it, working in the Commonwealth is not burdensome for a doctor, um, especially if we did away with the health insurance industry. Um, and then you wouldn't come out with $200,000 in debt, <laughs> you know, uh, for your, your medical school tuition. I think that would be a good thing to do on in general. Um, but, you know, it's, certainly, it's something that we could imagine funding in the bill. Yeah. And I'm uh, getting ready to, uh, we're getting ready to close at eight. But I wanted to just acknowledge there were questions in the chat that go to the strategy of winning the campaign more than to the economics of the bill. Um, and some of the, this discussion is just has to continually um, come up as we, we work with the legislature and we work with the people in the grassroots. So we're not, I'm not asking you to answer these questions, but I thought I would acknowledge that there was, um, the um, a few that that are you know things to worry about. Uh, Candace, won't the elite hospitals do everything in their power to defeat this? Madeline, I don't understand how we can counter the power of the hospital industry, the drug industry, and the insurance company. Uh, Henry, what if the feds refuse to release Medicare funds to the trust? And, and we will be working with our uh, hubs and the unions and the other organizations that are part of our coalition to solve these problems that definitely exist for every, for Massachusetts and every state that wants to uh, establish a single payer. And we're closely watching how California and New York are also navigating these same questions and uh, working with their constituencies to win because they've actually gotten majorities in their uh, legislature one house or the other. So with that, um, I'd like to uh, turn the, uh, the, the mic back to Sean. And we have, I guess we had a few hand raised too. Yeah, and we, we do currently have one. Thanks very much, John, for handling all those questions. Um, we can go to Don, who's got a hand up right now. Um, yes, uh, you know, it, it's obvious that uh, everything that, uh, Gerald said uh, today is an Im imperative for Massachusetts and uh, really uh, should be done. But I'm I'm a Californian, so I would not benefit from a plan in Massachusetts. But one of my favorite economists did write a book, uh, Medicare for All, uh, old Gerald Friedman, uh, for the entire nation. And uh, we really need to do this for the entire nation. But the problem is we've been talking about it for a few decades and we haven't uh, uh, gotten there yet, uh, anywhere near there. And that's what we have to do now. We have to uh, 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 you know, enact the, the program. And uh, you know, Gerald has provided us with a tremendous amount of data that does make it an imperative for the national, for the entire nation. And we have to go to Congress now and we have to get the program uh, moving. I, you know, there, I see no other option. So is that right, Jerry? Absolutely. Uh, do we have time for my joke? It's actually <laughs> Wilbur Mills's joke. I think Don might have heard this or know this already. Wilbur Mills, chair of the House Ways and Means Committee for many years, um, said that when Harry Truman died, he went to heaven and St. Peter greeted him and said, oh, Mr. President, the big guy wants to see you. And Harry Truman went before God 
And in all her majesty, she spoke down to him and said, Mr. President, you were such a good man. I want to give you a gift. You may ask me one question. So Truman asks, will we get health insurance, national health insurance in the United States? And God said, oh, of course we will. Just not in my lifetime. <laughs> I hope we get it in my lifetime. <laughs> Thanks. We certainly do all hope that. Yeah, thanks uh, very much, Jerry. I uh, uh, just wanted to make sure we, we do have a little more time. So if people have other questions, we could take a couple more. Uh, but I just wanted to thank uh, Jerry for the great presentation tonight and for, for all of your work over the years on this. Um, thanks to John for fielding questions. Thanks to Stephanie at Mass Care. Uh, also, just you know, people she put it in the chat as well, but uh, Mass Care is hosting a lobby day at the State House in Boston next Thursday, May 4th, a week from tomorrow. Uh, and so you can go to the Mass Care site at the link there and find out more details about how to participate. And so, yeah, do we have any, any final questions that anyone has? Well, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure, always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, to this group. Thank you, Jerry. Always a pleasure having you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.